Okay, good morning, everyone. I think I will start now. Um, people are probably still signing in, but because we have a very tight schedule today, um, we will start. Um, I'm Daphne Lei, Professor of Drama and the Interim Director of Illuminations. So today we have a very, very exciting program and welcome joining us from all over the globe. Um, so there's so much uncovered history in, of Chinese Americans and Chinatowns in the past 200 years. Uh, the 1880, 1882 Exclusion Act significantly changed the lives of Chinese Americans. And the 1906 earthquake and fire destroyed San Francisco Chinatown and again altered many people's lives. But Chinatown was rebuilt and that started a new history of Chinese American lives. So today we are going to uh, have a chance to take a peek of this treasure trove of the first part of the 20th century of San Francisco Chinatown. And we have this pleasure to see this wonderful documentary, a new documentary called Vanishing Chinatown, the world of May's photo studio. And this is a, uh, documentary about the May Studio, uh, which I'm not gonna talk too much about it because I want you to find out about that in the film itself. Uh, but this studio uh, uh, documented a very, very significant part of Chinese American history in the first part of the 20th century. And then we will show this documentary and then uh, we will have a panel with uh, four participations, uh, participants. And two people are from the production side of the documentary, Wiley Wang um, and, uh, and Emiko Omori. And then the other two are from the UCI side. It's a professor, um, Isabella Quintana and a graduate student, Chen Ru Li. So I will introduce them just right before they talk so you can put their, their credit and their uh, face together. And, before we start, I want to first thank uh, our university librarian, Lorelai Tangji, who's the one who actually brought the attention of this film to me. Uh, so I watched it, so I got very excited. I really want to share this with the entire campus. And then I also want to thank Lydia Tangji, her sister, who's the producer of the film, who worked uh, with me tirelessly throughout the whole process of getting this film screened. Um, so uh, also before we start, I just want to let students know that um, the chat is only reserved for the panelists uh, for private use. So if you have questions, uh, you can type in the Q&A box, which is under uh, on the right hand side uh, at the bottom of, of your screen at the, on the right hand side. And we will probably have a little bit of time to get to a Q&A question. So you can you can type in the questions throughout the film, but then we they won't be answered until uh, the end of the film, till the end of uh, the, you know, after the discussion, after the panelist presentation, and then we'll have discussion. So I guess without further ado, let's start the film. Okay. So let's start with our panel. And so we have four panelists today. Uh, the first one I think you are all dying to meet him is uh, Wiley Wong. Um, well, Wiley Wong is an antique Asian art collector and a dealer. And he is also the savior <laughs> of the 700 plus photos uh, to which inspired this, this, uh, this film. Um, and he's also a curator and gallery owner he received his MFA from California College of Arts and Crafts and has been on board uh, of the San Francisco Chinese Culture Center and, and as a league member of Asian Art, board, uh, Asian Art Museum and the consultant for uh, Chinese Historical Society of America. And he has also curated many exhibitions uh, for the Chinese Cultural Center uh, and an exhibition of May's photographs at the Bank of America and which, is, uh, which uh, travels to Hong Kong and China. And then um, 
He also has an online exhibition for the Museum of Performance and Design and where he donated 400 plus prints of May Studio photographs. So today he will just share with us a little bit about his, um, his experience with uh, this, this whole process, yeah. yeah. Hi, good morning. Um, I was, I'm the finder of the photographs. I'm not, I didn't discover anything. In fact, I wasn't even looking for photographs. I was living outside of Chinatown at that time. And just ironically, I was on a block away from where the Chan family lived. But anyway, I wasn't even looking for Chinese uh, photo photography. I was looking for paintings and calligraphy. And that's what I initially found at the May studio. I never even knew there was a, a photo studio attached you know, to, you know, to this business. So uh, one day I came to the, to the shop on Sacramento Street and the, a dumpster was there and guys were hauling out photos. And I immediately looked in, entered the dumpster. It was a side loading dumpster. So I didn't really have to jump in like dumpster diving. But um, the first one was that beautiful uh, hand colored with the glitter photographs. And I knew it was important. As soon as I saw more photographs coming out, these guys said, oh, we've got more, but they will charge me. So I started sifting uh, through the photographs for the next 10 days. And I amassed my collection at the source. I know there's other collectors that have even more photographs, but I was at the very first, first person in, at the fountain. So I was really lucky. I was initially drawn to the Chinese opera photographs because I've always been attracted to Chinese theater since my grandmother and grandfather took me to the Chinese opera. And I knew imp uh, that it was important right away. Um, I also discovered uh, you know, during that process, the social scenes, I mean, the beautiful uh, banquets and portraits and the uh, and another thing that we didn't talk about were the glass negatives. So I grabbed the glass negatives also. So I think the best prints come from the eight by 10 glass negatives. As you know, so, uh, the photographs are, are also now housed at the Museum of Performance and Design in San Francisco, and also at the Green Library at Stanford University in the Special Collections Department. And um, anyway, what, what was I gonna say? Uh, the, uh, the Pear Garden also came out of the, and this, this was with the late historian Jack Chen. Mm -hmm. And so he put a lot of miles and work into you know, promoting the photographs. But I think the photographs have done really, really well at Stanford. It was fun to look at them again when I went to the library there. I mean, everything is in an archival box and you got to use white gloves and it's being treated better and shared more now that I've given them away and it's accessible to scholars and, 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 and researchers from all over the world. And I'm really pleased about that because it's better than be taking up room on my closet floor. And uh, like I said, now I think there's more stories to be told. I mean, Emiko, our director, teased out a beautiful narrative and I'm really pleased with what she's done. But there's also other stories in there. I mean, there's so much material that, and uh, that I think, I hope future scholars will take a look. Anyway, anything, <laughs> Daphne, is that enough? Or do you have another so, question? Yeah, so just just briefly. So what's uh, just throughout the process of, of the filmmaking, what was your role there? Um, I guess uh, pushing my favorite images and uh, keeping uh, some of the narrative about the Chinese opera was something that Lydia and I really wanted to uh, emphasize because there, most of my photographs, I would say half the collection that I've given to Stanford and the Museum of Performance is on the Chinese theater. And it was such a unique glimpse that, uh, anyway, that was one of my focuses for this, 
film our documentary. Yeah. yeah. I I saw I, I went to the Pear Garden exhibit. It was I like think early 2000s. Because I, right. I was, yeah, I was a postdoc at Stanford at that time. So so I didn't, yeah, I guess I saw some of those photos. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. glad you did. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So our second panelist uh, is Emika uh, um, Omori, and she will tell us about her uh, her experience with this because she's the director of, of this film. And she's also a pioneer Asian American camera woman at KUED's newsroom. And she has taught at USC, San Francisco State and other universities. She has shot, edited, and produced many films. And I'm just uh, highlighting a few. Uh, so Rabbit uh, in the Moon. And for this one, she received the National Emmy Award for Outstanding Historical Program. And this film premiered in Sundance Festival and then uh, later was broadcast on public television, uh, public television's POV. And then other films include Hot Summer Wings, and this is for PBS American Playhouse, and California and American Dream, uh, Ripe for Change. She was recently featured in uh, Director's Forte Night uh, at the Museum of, of Modern Art in New York. And her installation, When Rabbit Left the Moon, was shown at the San Francisco Asian Art Museum. Uh, so. And Michael, so you can tell us a little bit about um, the whole process. It's so exciting. Well, thank you for uh, having this entire program and inviting us to be part of it. Um, and um, thank you for that introduction. <laughs> when it's all put together, it does sound, um, well, I've been doing this a long time. So, um, well, every time I see the film, and, you know, I have seen it a lot, but not recently, you know, not when it was finished. Uh, and so there's space between the times I see it. I am so taken by the photographs. They are stunning on, on all levels. And um, that is really what attracted me to the project. Um, of course, Lydia is a dear friend, you know, she um, uh, has, worked as somewhat, you know, sometimes in the film business, but mostly in theater. Uh, and we've known each other for a very long time. And she started this film uh, 20 years ago, right, Wiley? Yes. Lee, <laughs> <laughs> I said, Wiley, because those early interviews, he kind of looks similar now. I mean, if he'd gone bald or something, it would have been really hard to kind of integrate, like, Wiley 20 years ago and Wiley today, but thank goodness Wiley kept his looks. Um, <laughs> and um, they had been, you know, filmmaking is a struggle no matter what. And so of course it's all the fundraising and all that. So, you know, it, lots of things take a long time. Um, so when I got involved, which has been like maybe two, two or three years ago now, um, the, they had gone down many paths. Uh, and I think the difficulty with the film was um, th there, there were no family members that we could locate. And um, ultimately after uh, Wiley uh, contributed the, the photographs to Stanford, we started this relationship with Stanford and we got on this little website and all that. And lo and behold, Corrine Chan, the granddaughter, came to us because her son went to Stanford. I mean, it was all like, again, almost accidental that we found her and she found us. And uh, so we j just by some phone calls and everything, we flew her over and we did this interview with her. You know, again, really not knowing much about her. Well, she was the director's dream come true. She was a wonderful interview. She would, you know, she had all these stories, uh, that personal stories, because, you know, like we, we didn't know, no, we couldn't, you know, like who were these people? We, we just didn't know. Now, through his photographs, I had an impression of 
particularly Leo, because I think Leo did most of the work in the, the dark room. This is our sort of uh, conception is that uh, may, ha may have started early, but eventually she probably you know, got more involved with other things, community works and stuff. And he sort of did the studio work. <clears throat> But just seeing his photographs, one, I could see how he had a real sense of humor. I mean, the fishing photos are hilarious. And that he had this flair for like collaging and, um, and imagination. And I kind and probably because of his involvement with the theater, opera, and he had access to those amazing backdrops. That the photographs are so rich. Uh, you know, there's a lot of studio photographs and you've got like this plain background or flowers or something in the back. But here was a rich, itself a story going on behind the people <clears throat> who are, you know, in, in the photos. And then just getting a little into kind of the history of, of photography, it, it really was a, um, a kind of a, a social leveler because now just if you were, you could, uh, photographs were cheap enough that if you weren't really rich, but just a working person, you could afford a photograph. And, um, you know, when you think about it, prior to photography, people just didn't have anything of any images of their ancestors. I and mean, I was thinking about that this morning, looking at this one old photograph of my family. It goes back to, I think maybe my great, great grandfather, and that's it. I, we don't know what anybody looks like before that. Um, so on, on all levels, like this is a story about a little bit about photography, but about particularly, and of course, photography in Chinatown and how um, uh, it, it has that people could present themselves in these photographs as they wanted to be seen or remembered. So I see the photo studio as kind of a dream factory. Mm -hmm. That that's where you go to realize the dream of having come here and to be successful. Because I know for uh, the picture bride uh, photographs in the Japanese American community, when men here would have their pictures taken, they would borrow a suit. They'd stand in front of a car. And this was just to imply that they had succeeded in America, whereas maybe they didn't. Maybe they lived in a, a hovel, most likely, uh, rather than owning a car, for instance. So when I see these photographs in this studio setting where people are, uh, and you know, it, there is a Chinese tradition to portraiture, you know, like holding a book or, you know, background things that imply your life, you know, your success. I mean, the one of my, fo uh, well, several of my favorite photographs is in one section of the movie. And one of them is that man sitting, he's kind of small in the foreground. And then there's this gigantic background as though he's in his palatial house. And um, so I, th I look at these photos and they all have some stories that I think are the dreams and, and, uh, of of the, the the sitters, you know, the people who are are helping the photographer realize whatever image they'd like to leave behind, and then this collaging of the families. Now that came to me not right away. I, I would look at these photos and go, "There's something kind of odd, like proportionally, this person seems a little big or something." <clears throat> and then oh, we got. Uh, some photos where you could actually see they've been cut out and pasted on there, you know. Uh, but I think what Leo did was very artistic. I mean, he he was somehow managed to really hide the seams, and um, and so he was uh, an artist. You know, he started off really as just like a businessman. Oh well, we need a photography studio in Chinatown. Let's start one. But uh, you know gluing on sequins to those, and you know, those photographs, especially the ones that Wally talked about, they're big. They're like, you know, and he painted every inch of it. And then he would glue on things. I go, I think Leo was having a good time. Yes. 
Right. Anyway, yeah. there you go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I love those fishing photo too. <laughs> and um, the, our next panelist is Isabella Kitana. And uh, she's an assistant professor of Asian American studies here at UCI. Um, she teaches and writes about critical relations and comparative eth ethnic studies uh, with a focus on Asian American and Chicanx and Latinx histories. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming today. Uh, it's just, it's so there's so much in the film that um, there's to respond to. And it's just so very exciting. Um, but I, I, I did want to say that um, that my research focuses on um, Chinatown and Sonora Town in Los Angeles um, from the late 19th century into the early 20th century. Um, but the so there's not a lot of photographs <laughs> from that time period, but um, but all of, but seeing all these photographs actually reminded me of um, my my grandfather who's a he was um, he was a phot photographer in Chinatown in New York, um, but he was a hobby photographer because um, he actually worked in laundry and and restaurant more so. Um, but uh, I just recently got to see some photos that he had taken that my I didn't even know that my dad had like taken them and hidden them in the house. <laughs> um, also, they're not very well protected. So I, we're, we're trying to work on that. But um, just some really great photos that he took all around New York City. And um, my mom was sort of his, his uh, model <laughs> for those photographs. So um, just the power of these photographs to tell the story of um, not just the people, but of the place that they live in, um, and um, sort of what that what that might look like. And even though the photographs in um, or a lot of the photographs uh, that you feature in the in the film are staged, right? That they still tell a story um, of everyday people, um, you know, even though it's it's staged and they're not like in their in their house or um, you know, like on the corner. Um, but a few things that I wanted to talk about, just um, uh, um, Dr. Lay asked me to talk a little bit about from my research perspective um, and this idea of vanishing. Um, I think it, it's really powerful to think about vanishing, especially how in the beginning of the film where the people sort of reappear in another in another photo and disappear you know and, and to really show how families were affected um, by exclusion um, and so one of the one of the things that I talk about in my uh, my book that I'm trying to finish frantically very, as quickly as possible um, but that uh, is is the way that people's everyday lives were affected by um, by borders so meaning Chinese exclusion, uh, anti-Chinese violence, um, anti-Mexican violence, and and that. And so in the case of Los Angeles, Chinatown, they settled in was a primarily uh, a Spanish-Mexican area. And so that's a really important part of the story of LA Chinatown, the, the first one they call Old Chinatown. Um, so, you know, I think that um, there's some things about everyday, the everyday life that, that in your photos, uh, that in the, in the, in the, um, in the film show, like, um, the news, right. The news being written on those pages and, um, included in the, in the, uh, the scene, um, that in LA Chinatown, right along the plaza, um, there was a, they called the wall. Um, and that's where a lot of Chinese men would stand and read read the news and they would talk about it together. Um, so it became this sort of place of, um, of community, but also intellectual intellectual community, right? Sort of talking about the, the, the events of the day, what was going on in China, um, what was going on in other Chinatowns also, right? Um, and they actually, they would stand there on the wall um, in the, let's see, the, the early, let's see, the, the tens through the twenties. I actually have a photo um, that I found in the archive of them standing there in the, I believe it was in the thirties. Um, but right, just 
half a block away from them in across the Plaza Park was uh, Mexican men who were, you know, talking about um, the Mexican Revolution, right? And so that so the the ways that these uh, places uh, like Chinatown are are not just um, they're so vibrant, right? With this kind of with with community and people doing the everyday things of living and um, trying to find work and, and stuff like that. So in my in my research, I talk especially about um, about women and and uh, in Chinatown, particularly Chinese women, who um, there were very few of them obviously before um, World War II. Um, and especially they they more of them came after um, wives were allowed to come. Um, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act was changed so that wives could wives could come for a short time, and that produced um, a whole generation of Chinese American youth that came of age sort of at around the same time, like a cohort kind of, um, and they they came of age between the twenties and the forties, um, and that population of young people and of the women who did so much work sort of behind the scenes and as you know, it's when usually when we talk about Chinatown, um, LA, it's like there's these vegetable ve vegetable uh, produce um, sellers. Um, there's the men who worked in people's homes as like um, in domestic work. Um, there's uh, I spent in the 20s. There ends up being a lot of Hollywood <laughs> going on, um, and and recruitment of extras um, from Chinatown in particular because there was such a an interest in the amongst mainstream America of Chinese things and Chinese myths, right? Um, so a lot of focus gets put on that, but not on the women who helped to raise those children and who created community sort of behind the scenes because they didn't often um, leave their their homes. Um, but doing a lot of that work like um, getting, preparing um, food for the produce so that they could, the men could take it to the market to sell um, and doing that while they're taking care of their children and then doing it together, right? And sort of creating community that way. Um, so, so this this sort of like vibrancy of the community um, becomes very important. And the last thing that I wanted to say is about the idea of disappearing, like vanishing, um, vanishing Chinatown. Uh, the, the Los Angeles Chinatown was, uh, the original Chinatown was raised to the ground in the 1930s to build Union Station. And that's, that's, the, that's the sort of story that we usually hear, but it wasn't just Chinatown, it was also um, a lot of the, the the surrounding communities, so Mexicans, especially um, as one of as the, the biggest population there, was also affected by urban renewal. Um, so Chinatown um, was raised to build Union Station, and a little part of it was still there, like a like a four block little area, and that was destroyed in the 1940s to build the freeway. Um, so one of the things that the arguments that I make um, is that this this urban renewal is not just about urban renewal, and um, that it is about um, about deploying ideas about borders and exclusion um, against this population that was already especially vulnerable, right? Um, so um, and then the other thing is that that Chinatown there. Um, has been destroyed, but the people didn't. And so they created other communities, other Chinatowns. And so there's a there's a project that I'm a part of that um, with the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California about um, the five Chinatowns uh, before 1965. Um, so we look at other other settlements of Chinese people that um, as they, you know, they, they survived and they persisted and they built their communities elsewhere after they were kicked out. So, um, so I just think that this this film is just so exciting to to see and to like sort of help help to think through some of those some of those aspects of um, place right and and why does place matter and how is place made by the people who live there so thank you yeah thank you Chinatown does live on <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. Uh, finally, we have uh, Qian Ru Li, uh, so our final 
panelist, and Chen Ru is a PhD student of drama. Um, their current research centers on contemporary Chinese diaspora performance in the U.S. Chinatowns. So, Chen Ru. Hi. Um, thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much for being here. I'm just so honored to be on this panel with all of you. Um, it's such a rich film. Um, what I um, my first reaction after I, I watched this film is, well, you see, Chinatown is just a story to be invented and to be reinvented. Um, it's, it's a story because um, the images that we have seen that is coming out from the May studio, um, it, in thinking about um, a lot of them have to um, be hand painted, we have to, the color, you have to hand paint the color on it. So it's that, um, you know, the photographer have to have to recreate some kind of a scene by hand um, to, to tell a story of what is it like to live in the space um, at the time. But it actually also reminds me of another photographer um, whose name is Jensen. So Jensen also has a, you know, a, um, he also takes, took a lot of photographs of San Francisco Chinatown and he also retouched his photos, but he retouched them for a very distinct purpose. Um, he retouched them to create the Chinatown as this exotic space. You know, it's, it's very, um, it, his images are very centered on the colonial gaze, um, looking into people living in the space while thinking through what May studio we have, we have a studio ourselves how exciting that is. Our story is not just being told by others. We can tell our own stories as well, right? That's so significant to me because um, many of you probably know this and thinking about another important photograph in Chinese American history, the champagne photo, right? The photo that was taken after the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. And there are many arguments saying in that photo, um, there's no Chinese presence in that photo. While, um, you know, historians Gordon Chang, um, his more recent research might tell us there's a complication in that. But just to remind us, um, Chinese has been excluded, not just um, spatially, it's also excluded in the story of the mainstream of what it is, um, what does America mean and what it is to be an American. Um, and, the, and, our, and the director and other panelists has already talked about this. The studio is not just a space of imagination or a, a dream space, it's also a shelter. It provides this shelter for, you know, at the time, many immigrants at the time, they, they are probably laborers. They came here um, right, to, to build a railroad and, and to do very heavy, heavy you know, labor work. But in the image, in the photos, they can temporarily um, wear some really good clothes, holding a book in their hand. Um, be the person that they wanted to be and they wanted to be remembered. That's really important to me in, in thinking about um, um, in the film, people talk about, oh, it was really hard for us to go outside of Chinatown. So my question is, so when people, when it's very challenging for people to go out, what happened was um, they, they found their space on stage. They found their space in photo studios but that doesn't mean it's just they they live in dreams that they created for themselves because there are like the chinese opera stories there are you know the um about the emperor older emperor's stories but they're also i saw um they were re they were also reenacting the stories about the war that was going on in china at the time and that's also very huge to me in thinking about being a diaspora you cannot, there are so many limitations for you to participate what's happening um, in your home country, but the diaspora didn't, for, you know, they, they still find alternative ways to, to enact, to participate, to be part of that history. And just also a reminder of, to myself, because I, I study war, so it's a reminder of, you know, war doesn't have Orders. It's not just a war just happen in one space. It comes, um, you know, it, it comes to different spaces. 
And another thing that um, I noticed from the film is this exclusion of the quote unquote illegal immigrants is, is heavily politicized, right? This, is set, this deportation of the paper sons and daughters was tied into the anti-communism rhetoric at the time in the, in the 40s and 50s. So in thinking about the, where we are in 2020 and thinking about we're so close to the Southern border, I think that's just thinking about the legal, illegal, the legality and the, how, how much of that is tied into the politics as well. Um, and um, and the, the next point I want to highlight is, um, Dr. Quintana has already um, highlighted this point, is the role of women. Um, the, it, the interviewee, the woman, she said, oh, as women, we're actually able to restore the, our real family name through marriage. By getting married, we could finally drop the name that my family, my ancestor had to, the fake name my ancestor had to carry on. But, but woman, actually it's through woman. That's, yes, that's, that's such an encouraging moment for myself. Um, and lastly, I want to end my, um, end my highlight on, um, in thinking about, you know, um, 100 years ago, People living in Chinatown, they can't go out. Um, so they, they, they find their way into the opera space, the photo space, but that doesn't mean they lost a connection with reality, right? They're still reenacting wars, the wars that was going on um, on stage. And thinking about where we are 2020, it's, we are also, it's also challenging for us to go outside because of the pandemic and the fires if you are in Irvine today. But, I'm just really grateful for events like this to keep me engaged with the reality. We are still with the reality by being engaged in this event. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I would love to hear a lot from you, a lot more from you. Unfortunately, we don't have that much time today. Uh, just before we go on to the Q&A part, so if people who have questions, you could type in, in the Q&A place and, and then, you know, then we'll ask the questions to the panelists. Uh, I wanna remind people on Thursday, if you're interested in Chinese opera, we have another event. Uh, which is called uh, Chinatown Opera Theaters in North America. Uh, it oh, is, uh, yeah, it is, it is, uh, we have Nancy Rao, Professor Nancy Rao will uh, talk about her book. So she wrote a big book, um, the Chinatown Operas in North America. And so that will be Thursday, uh, noon to 1.20 um, Pacific time. Uh, so I hope you can join us too. That's also part of the illumination event. So you could uh, check out that detail from the calendar. Uh, so I, I myself does re do research on Chinese opera in the 19th century. So, so we hear at uh, 19th century and, and then today we talk about fir first part of uh, 20th century. And then on Thursday, we're gonna talk about that as well. So it's just very fascinating to hear uh, all these parts. Um, and then just uh, quickly, I, I just wanna also think about, um, so it's not just about dream making and dream factory, right? This is like the earliest Photoshop too, right? Like now we are so used to uh, retouching photos uh, with our apps, but then this is like hand retouch the photos. And I also wanna remind people that one thing about those, the functions for these photos are actually for them to mail uh, mail them to, to their families in China. So the dream making, it's not just that, yes, I'm doing well. I have this moment of dream and I'm being the king, I'm being whatever, but also to tell your parents, yeah, we're doing well, we're doing fine. Look at this, look at the glitters on my, on my, um, on my clothes. So that's just, just also a, a very, very wonderful idea to think about how, what kind of, um, you know, dreams that not just for themselves, but also for their parents and family members. Um, so for the questions, so one is uh, what department are the photos in at Stanford? And this is from, yeah. So this is a Wiley question, I think. Oh, uh, the, it's the, in the, the Green Library, right? So it should be the-, the, the Green Library yeah. has special collections. You have to make an appointment because 
all the photographs are stored off site. So you need about three or four days in advance before you get to make a reservation and they'll bring the boxes to you. There's mm -hmm. probably 20 boxes of photos there now. But so one, they accessible have, to future creatives. They, they have digitized many of them. So you can yes. see them online. Yeah. In okay. fact, uh, Stanford very generously digitized all the photos that we got from them for us. Um, they're high resolution digi uh, you know, digital files. And um, so you can see lots and lots of them online. Mm -hmm. uh, but the yes, if you want to see them in person. What? The Museum of Performance and Design also has a collection of my mm -hmm. photos, um, mostly on the theater, of course. Museum of Performance and Design, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So is that, that also... So is, is that also a place where you can do research? You can, you can have access yes, to yes. it also? And, and, and they have the photographs on site, not like Stanford, which is off-site storage. But are they digitized so they can, you can see them online? They have, it, they, have, they, they have them digitized too. Not all of them. I, mm -hmm. well, I think all of them, yeah. All mm -hmm. of them are digitized. It's called the Wiley Wong Collection at Museum okay. of Performance and Design. Stanford also has my Chinatown ephemera, which I gave along with my photographs. The mm -hmm. Chinatown ephemera being playbills, posters, mm -hmm. old advertising. So there's several, uh, uh, several hundred. Uh, and there's also some paintings by the backdrop painter, but mm -hmm. they were, they're smaller and they were in the interior of an old restaurant on Grant Avenue. So there's also my ephemera to, to research. I love ephemera. I, I think also, the the photo studio is kind of vanishing not the you know that now like when in the 50s we would go to like sears roebuck and then we'd be in front of like some plain mm -hmm. colored or something background and um you know it wasn't and you're just there i, I love the the atmosphere uh it, very theatrical you know uh, obviously because uh leo the family was connected to the opera, you get these very theatrical backgrounds. And there's a current very interesting artist from Shanghai named Ma Leon. And there's a fabulous movie on him called Our Time Machine. And he, he said the same thing. He went around uh, with a truck, two, two uh, not trucks, but two um, vans and went to various cities in China and took backgrounds and let people be, do, you know, dress up the way they want. You know, again, it's kind of what the people themselves who are the sitters get to dictate how they want to be shown and presented. And he has a huge collection of old photographs with these amazing backdrops. And, uh, oh, and so this photograph I saw of my, I think he's my great, great grandfather. This is in Japan. There's like some kind of Greek column behind them and i i go what's that about you know <laughs> yeah uh, this kind of backdrop uh painting a theater scenery it's it was you know it was the major way of doing scenery in the 19th century yeah. however going to 20th century we became much more realistic that kind of theater realism based theater however this kind of practice uh, was kind of reserved, preserved in Chinese theater. So if you see Cantonese opera in 20th century, they still use backdrop. Even today, Cantonese opera, they use backdrop. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it's sort of like a frozen history, a 19th century history was preserved in even contemporary Chinese opera uh, performance. Because I remember I was involved in one performance in uh, early 2000s in uh, Oakland and Cantonese opera. And then they actually have people in China paint the backdrop and to be used <laughs> in their performance. Yes. I think the photographs also show that the Chinese costumes in the 1920s were very different from Chinese opera today. Mm -hmm. I mean, the 20s, I mean, the photographs seem to preserve Cantonese opera as it was almost a, over a hundred years ago. 
-hmm. As you know, the performance style has changed since then, or the right. costuming. And in, uh, in Cantonese opera is one of the most progressive uh, kind of uh, Chinese operas. What I mean progressive is it's wild. It's, it's one of the first operas. They take all these Western ideas. And so you see their costumes. Some of them just have, have you know, like sequence, for instance. It's at first adopted by Cantonese opera uh, because they, they are much better than, than silk to reflect light uh, on stage. And in other genres, they didn't do that, but Cantonese opera it was really this kind of avant-garde uh, opera. <laughs> yeah. Well, Doctor Who, I didn't get to, yeah. to, didn't manage to get this into the documentary, but Doctor Who said in Chinatown, there were, well, at least two theaters or maybe more, and they had different points of view. He said, so you could go to one, th it would be the same story, some political story, but you would have the right view and the left view or central view or whatever. So he said you could go, you know, depending on your political persuasion, you could go to like the version, like Fox News version versus MSNBC or something. And so there's a very rich story in the opera. So I am I think this Nancy Rao uh, uh, presentation is going to be fabulous. Yeah. And Great Star Theater uh, is, still, um, uh, is still there on Jackson Street. Yeah. yeah, and then I think it was built in 1920. It is it's the oldest existing uh, Chinese opera theater in the U.S. Um, you know, and, and we were, excuse me, we were to have our premiere screening there mm. for uh, the CAM festival, but of course, COVID, so, <laughs> so we couldn't do it, but we were so excited that it would play in the actual theaters that they themselves were documenting. Right. And then the, the Great Star Theater was used as a movie theater too, yes. right? You yeah, know, later the, on. Yes. yeah, for their, uh, you know, the Shaw Brothers films and they were shown there a lot. Yeah, and I remember last time they, I, I saw them doing a, a, a play and the, uh, Cantonese opera play in in uh, Great Star Theater. There, the the power was not quite enough. They had to, they had to use some, you know, yeah, table to to bring bringing power to for the modern technology now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we are almost at time. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah. I wonder if uh, throughout the film process, do you, uh, from the collector and the director, and do you have any kind of conflict? Like, no, we need to present this this uh, photograph. No, we need to tell that story. What kind of negotiation process was that? Yeah. Hmm. Well, well, I think the, for me as a director, when Corinne Chan came into the picture, she really was the through line. She, what I call, gave the movie a heart and soul. Before that, it was more informational and look what we found and, you know, it just, and so I think we all agreed when Corinne came into the picture, it just sort of that was it. She was, she is the heart of, of the movie. Yeah, because she actually said, well, I remember this. She has the, the memory, the personal memory of the, some of the photos. Yeah. So one story that, again, I couldn't get in, um, was when she talked about her grandfather fishing, that he would hang the fish, I think in their garage or something, to dry it to make hum you. So I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with that dish. <laughs> Yeah. Fried fish and the pork. Oh, okay. Salty fish. Right. Yes. All right. Okay, we'll have to end at that fish story uh, for today's event. <laughs> thank you so much uh, for the panelists and, and just really thank you so much. And I, I will want to know more about, about your research and then, uh, and you know, films like this in the future. So keep, keep in touch and um, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Nice to meet everybody.